Okay, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, it is so good to to see everyone. Um, I think it's just awesome uh, to be back with you in person. Uh, I'm feeling most of the way recovered from my serious bout with likely COVID-19 this past week and um, really energized to to be with you today. It's it's been a while. It's been a while since we've been through that. And uh I want to have some conversations about that. Uh about well in light of that I should say. Um I will be wearing my mask today. Um I'm quite certain I'm beyond the transmissible phase of 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 my uh bout. Um my wife uh, and I uh, been together since uh, since Saturday. Um, continuously, we haven't we haven't had any issues on her part. So, uh, and that's been maskless. But I decided I, you know, uh, it, it, it was with an abundance of and the principle of the abundance of caution. I should really don a mask and. And stay masked uh, for today's session just to minimize any risk. But uh, I think the risk is virtually non existent based on what we're seeing. But my wife and uh, the incubation period for the variants that are circulating in this now. Um, now, since uh, I have had the, the great pleasure of, of being with you in person, we've covered a lot of material. Um, and I, I wanted to reflect on this because we made a transition just before that time. And unfortunately, my absence was um, juxtaposed with this new topic of agent-based modeling. And so you've had the disadvantage of going through a lot of agent-based modeling topics with me in absentia, with, with me not being physically here. And that pains me um, every bit as much, maybe more so than you know my my physical illness. And I I want to want to reflect on some of the some of the principles because I, I don't want them to be lost. The key principles we cover um, now, of course, our first exposure to agent based modeling occurred in the first few sessions of this class. Can anyone tell me a couple central features of an agent-based model? Maybe if, if you want emphasizing things by which it differs from the sort of aggregate system dynamics models we've been looking at. What is it what is it that distinguishes an agent-based model? Can anyone say? Yes, Patrick. Fact that agents interact with their good, good. Yeah, there's this whole notion of environment. What's one way in which they might have a surrounding environment? We we saw it in the video for for last time on on last Thursday. What's one type of environment they might be in? It's characterized by Abby. Okay, other agents and agents to whom they connect through what sort of structure? Okay, yeah, those are so ring lattice, scale free, Poisson random, uh, small world. These are all examples of what? Networks. They're all examples of networks. Networks are about connectedness, they're about topology. Who's connected with them? But there's another type of environment with which agents might interact as well, that through which agents might interact with each other. And what sort of environment, what sort of aspect of the environment is that beyond a network? Sorry? Yeah. I didn't hear that. Agent layout. Uh, yeah, layout. Okay, I, I like that. Uh, I think what you're referring to, I would call spatial context it has, has to do with where things are you might call it layout um 
but it has to do with you know where where things are located and by extension how proximate one agent say a is to other agents say b and c right um yeah. um so we have spatial environments as well as connectedness or topological environments by which we're dealing with individual being connected. And you might reasonably ask if those two are completely distinct things, if they're totally independent, they're solitudes to one another, that one doesn't influence another, or if they're somehow coupled. Right? What do you think? Um, to what degree do you think the connection of networks might be spatially mediated. In other words, it reflects their spatial connection. Can you give an example of a type of of, of, of you know, relationship between agents or interaction between agents where it might be really important that they be co-located, they be located nearby in space? Yes, Patrick. Uh, the spread of an infection within the city. Indeed, indeed. Uh, the spread of an infection. Uh, might spread only locally. Can you give me an example of where networks might exist that aren't so spatially limited? I'm not going to say you, you don't see active impacts of space at all, but there, it's much more limited. Patrick. I'll say um, transferring messages on the internet. Yeah, transferring messages on the internet. Right, social networks like we might be engaged in on Instagram or Snapchat, or or you might engage in. You're an older generation, you know, in Facebook or LinkedIn or what have you, right? These are surely somewhat affected by spatial context. You might have more connections with people who are nearby you, who you run into a lot. You might collaborate more with them or you might interact more. But there might be many connections to very distant folks. And so this issue of of networks and the issue of space are not totally distinct, but neither are they totally is one totally derivative of the other. Neither is one like just determined by the other, right? You could have some networks that are very tied up with spatial distance, and some that go on further. Now, when I asked you to watch that video on networks, there was actually one type in there that was very, very much localized. Uh, and one type specifically for 2D space and another type for 1D space. Can anyone remember the names of those? One of the names actually came up a little bit earlier. Yes, uh, Rochelle. The, the space lattice. Ring lattice. Uh, so I, that's that's a great network name that we're going to be talking about. It turns out not to be the one for 2D space. There's one for 2D space. Uh, yes, Tyler. This is mixed. Yeah. It's kind of a blunt name. That, that name is not widespread, but it's, you know, it's a fair name to communicate it. Um, so there, a given agent, say A, is connected to other agents, say B and C, if and only if they walk, if and only if B lies within a certain distance of A, right? So it's like I'm connected with people within two meters of myself. Maybe for purposes of um, COVID-19. Sorry, Patrick. Ah. <laughs> um, so, so here with distance space, it's sort of totally dependent on, on spatial layout, but there's a 1D version, one dimension um, that occurs with ring lattice, where it's it's more common to treat it as kind of a, a logical ordering of agents. So we we number agents zero, one, two, three, and we connect each agent with its neighbors, and typically they're connected with, say, 
a certain number of neighbors on the left and a certain number of neighbors on the right here up to say h n n minus one what's n minus one connected to h n n minus one Uh, to n minus two for sure, but what else? To what? Yeah. To n, it, well, okay, but it's zero to n minus one, so that's n. So what is it connected to? There's no n. It's, if we have n of these, right? If there's two things, it's zero and one, right? That forms two. If it's three things, zero, one, two. So we have n things here, but H and N minus one is connected to which one? Zero. Zero. Yeah. Hence it's a ring, right? Um, it's it's arranged in a a toroid. Um, so it's it's toroidal space. Um, and uh, this space um, has no bounds. Hmm? Um, it's finite but unbounded. There's no boundaries either way, right? Um, and and this is often more a logical number. You could treat it as you could treat it as physical. You just have to arrange them, you know, in a in a ring, say a two D space, right? Now connectivity, not totally separate from location, but not totally the same. Something like, so let's let's talk about some of those other forms. Um, what's a form of network that depends on nothing but chance, whether two things are the same? Just sort of one chance, and, and in a kind of very uniform way, very, very sort of simple way, uh, where any two neighbors an agent is, or any any uh, any pair of agents are equally likely to be connected. What's something? Anyone remember the network type? Yes. Uh, name. T. T. Yes. Poisson random. Yeah. And this one goes by a bunch of different names. Poisson random. Um. Uh, so Poisson was a famous French mathematician who gave his name to the Poisson distribution, Poisson process of transitioning. And, and the random refers to it being a certain chance of, of being connected. It's, it's, it's not a chance over time, but it's it's a certain chance agents with a chance of being connected. So if you have any two agents, any pair of agents, they're equally likely to be connected. A distance-based network like this is highly localized. You're you're connected with nearby people by definition. Do you see that? With ring lattice, you're connected with nearby people by definition. They're maybe nearby, just logically nearby, but Often you put it in a random hence random lattice. With a Poisson random network, how much locality is there? To what degree am I interacting with people nearby me compared to people who knows where? Well, it's all about being connected to guess which one of those. Uh, it's all about being connected people who know it look my connection is equally likely with someone way off even if there is spatial bonus someone way off uh, someone nearby me it's just it's just you know uh equal likelihood regardless of our proximity there's no homophily there's no connection to others like you, uh, homophily is others like you and, and you're, you're connected or you, you like them, meaning you're connected to them. And there's there's no, there's actually a fancy word for it called propinquity. You don't, you're not responsible. Don't, don't worry about it. But 
often these are pronounced features of human interaction. I tend to connect more with people like me. That's propinquity. Homophily is I tend to interact more with people who are like me. Now, if you know me well, there's uh, not not many people that are exactly like me. I, I wish there were. I could hang around with them. They'd be my buddies. But um, but they're like me in certain respects. Um, so they like modeling, for example. They like, you know, I like modeling. And they often do too. Um, and I'm not talking like a fun cat model. I'm talking like, I'm talking interesting sort of model. Like, like you. Okay. Um, I'll leave the cat ones for someone else. Um, so, so homophily, ladies and gentlemen, um, is people who are kind of similar, homo. Um, they're similar to each other, um, like each other. They they spend they, by exception they're connected. So often we try to characterize things like this in our networks, and propinquity is captured by a distance based network and by a a, a, a ring lattice network. But on a random network doesn't capture any of that. People are equally likely to be connected. Now there's a there's a further construct that's called a small world network. It was also discussed in that video. What's a small world network? Uh, yeah, it's a combination of formal and random. And game free. Yeah. It's not skill free, but it's for some random is you just about got it. And ring line. Yeah. And and that's kind of juxtaposition. If I don't make mind saying so myself. Um it's it's a combination of something. Which is all about being connected to a nearby person. That's the ring lattice. That's this this guy over. Oh, yeah, I don't, I don't know. Sorry, Megan. Uh, it's it's this guy over here where people are only connected with people nearby them, people close to them. I could say the same thing with this. Um, and on the flip side. Where they're connected with anyone with equal likelihood. And the idea of a ring of a small world network is typically one of those is most common for a given person. They're going to have more of one of those than the other. Which which one are they more likely to have? Uh, totally random connections or connections to nearby people? Nearby, nearby. Most of my connections are to people closer to me, but I have some connections to people distant. Mm. Mm. Um, so, so small world sort of links up ring lattice. Just go here with plus on random. That's that gal there, and and there's some. Probability for each connection that a given person has, whether they'll be with with the nearby neighbors per the dictates of small of uh, ring lattice, or whether that person will be one of the typically small fraction, maybe it's five percent, maybe it's one percent of their connection that are just chosen random. So we can who knows what where. And that is designed to kind of model the fact that for the most part, we tend to have a lot of connections with nearby people, like my wife, um, for me, and I have some connections with people further away. Okay. Common circumstances. Very simple model. All you do is is by the average number of connections a given person has, and and then the 
fraction of those that are with nearby people. And, and actually, typically, you just specify the number of connections someone has, which would be on the ring lattice. So, like, I'm connected with two neighbors on each side, for example. So, I put a four connection. So, one neighbor on each side, so two connections. And then a certain probability that that connection will instead be to someone distant across the network, will be rewired to someone across the network. And it turns out that these mirror are some important aspects of, of, of human networks. The final type that's in the video that's discussed is called the scale free network. And if time allows, uh, I might give a special lecture on this. It's a very interesting network study. Does anyone remember some of the basic aspects of what a scale free network captures? Yes, Mark. Yeah, and what follows the power line? So that's your, your answer is off. Not unusual for you, but what is what aspect follows the power law? Do you remember? Yes. And when we say degree of a node, what are we talking about? Uh, yeah, the connectedness, and I'm going to boil it down to how many neighbors they have in the network. So A here would have degree one. Two. If, if I had C have connections like this to, you know, we'll make it D, E, F, G, it would have degree one. Five. Degree five. Sometimes it's called degree centrality. Because then we can also talk about between a centrality and I get value centrality and a bunch of other fancy types of, of centrality. But um, basically, it's coming the number of connections they have. And what Mark is saying, which is bang on, is that there's a power law distribution on the number of connections I have. Now, that, that sounds really fancy. But I don't remember the, the basic, just of that, the basic property that that, that has. Yes, Mark. Yeah. That's, that's right. So uh, that's kind of an emergent property that for. That's a feature that comes out of this distribution. That there are a few hubs, there are a comparatively small number of hubs, or when I say a hub, I mean a tons of connections. I mean like tons of connections. And then there are some that have, and then there, the vast majority have comparatively few connections. Mm -hmm. And And that's a feature of a lot of systems. Um, it's a feature of human systems. So if you look at the number of contacts people have, um, and I'm talking contacts of many types. Um, could be person-to-person -person contacts, but even more notably, the number of people with whom they share needles, or the number of people they in, in which they engage in sexual interactions, or the number of people with whom they collaborate, or whatever. There's there's going to be some people. Most people are going to have few, and then or not, and some people will have a very large number. Why do you care about that? Well, okay, so so that sounds like a random fact. Okay. Why do you care? Why do you care that some of tons, but most have few? It is a feature of the situation, but why is that important? Why is it important that our models capture it? After all, there's a lot of things. People hair color, you know, people's different sizes of their pinky, you know, try to capture the increased model. Why is that something we do want to capture? Yeah. 
It's important insight that comes out of agent-based modeling and individual-based modeling. It's important insight that's changed policy in certain areas, uh, certain health areas. Why is it important that there's such disparities, such huge differences in the number of connections people have? Well, it turns out that because of that, It's not, ladies and gentlemen, simply a matter of averages. It's not a matter of the typical person, their characteristics. It's not a matter of your average number of connections. Now, that, that is important, but that's not the only thing that's really important. The other thing is the variability and the degree of skew in the distribution that a small fraction by proportion of the population has a massive impact on the outcomes. So do you remember a long time ago, perhaps it seems to you in a galaxy far, far away, we had our not. Remember that? What was our not? It's in our mind. Basic reproduction number. What did it tell us? Okay, in a very special context, what's that context? Disease free equilibrium. Particularly, the particularly common. So no one else is infected, right? And the, the common case you think about is everyone around them is what? Susceptible. You're talking patient zero. Patient, ladies and gentlemen, zero. I was a big patient zero at last week's talk. I've been waiting to find out since the basic reproduction. Um, okay. Uh, so, so you remember that, but when you described that, you described it well, Rashid, as you are wrong. Um, that was Rashid, right? No, I'm, I'm sorry. I heard a voice in the center, and I didn't even look who it was. I should recognize the line by this claw. So, good, good job. I'm sorry, I didn't even look. Um, you know, as Jenna knows, last week at the conference, I recognized certain people by their voices. And that time I was a bang on, but I'm sorry. So I, I do apologies on this. Um, so are not, that was a good definition. But there was a key word which you didn't use in giving that excellent definition. Or maybe you did, and I just elided it in my mind. That is, this is the average number of people infected by an initial infective in an otherwise disease free population. The average. Okay. Um, and at an even more basic level, do you remember our models of infectious disease? And we had a few parameters, even in the most simple SIR model. Is it not right that I should also empower this side with with uh, some of the images, right? Uh, some of the drawing. So when we had an SIR model, can anyone remember and describe to me, characterize me? Three of the parameters that were were key, and, and for example, computing the R not three of the parameters that determined the progress of infection. Yeah, uh, contacts per day, and transmission probability, and what was the third box? The field average duration of infections. 
C beta tau, sometimes they're called tau mu, but it's the average duration of effect you know, the number of tiny in the string. But I want to draw attention to the first of them. Someone called that out. I don't know who was that. Uh, okay. Akash. Akash, yes. So Akash, this, you, you had you mentioned the name for this. What is it? That's right. But it's actually, that's, that's how I don't curse it. But when I did so, I was playing fast and loose. Why, why is that? What, what am I getting at? Is it just contacts per day? So the average contacts per day. Average across the what? Across the population. Per day, right? Average contacts. The mean contacts you'll sometimes can be right? Um, that's a, not like nasty contacts, right? It's not like I'm using it's average, it's statistical, right? Um, this is average contacts per day. And what scale free networks get us to realize? And if there's time in this class, and if only there were. I would give a lecture on that where this is derived. That when you have such big disparities as a power law suggests, and degrees as, as Mark said, or you have disparities associated with the underlying number of connections that 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 people have that govern those contacts, like contacts per day. Uh, it's not just me, it's the variability. It's the disparity. And that's a quantitative thing. It turns out that the actual, like the equivalent value you would see once you consider disparity, the sort of um, uh, appropriate value to see is not the average C, which I'll write as C bar, but also, a term associated with the variability of contacts, which I will write as sigma squared here, uh, divided by c. So this is this is the the variance in the number of contacts. The variance measures the measure of dispersion. It right? measures how how variable, how, how varying those are. If you have large vari variate, if everyone were the same, the variation would the variance would be one. If everyone had exactly the same contacts per day, what would the variance be in contacts? Zero. Zero. If a large part of the practice, if 50% of the people had zero, if 50% had one, now you're dealing with you know, a, 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 a quite substantial curve. Some of those formulas are just I don't want to remind that, but this ratio can often be as big as, as the average itself. So when you get variability in contact, pronounced variability, um, it leads to much larger effective effective sort of contact rates, as if the contact rate is much larger. It spreads much more quickly. Why is that? I mean, again, it could be a factoid to memorize. It wouldn't be that to get to do this. But, but why is that that it would spread faster if you have great variability of some of like tons of connections? Why did these why does it matter that there are these hubs out there? And, and then most people are small, but, but you have these hubs. Why do the hubs matter so much? There's two reasons. Two key reasons those hubs might matter particularly much. What are they? Yeah. 
Disseminate infection really effectively. Hmm? So they are like an accelerant on infection spread. They drive infection much faster forward. Quickly get infected and disseminate it with a band. It's not the average. It's the disparity. Now, there's many other spheres where we can take that left. But in this issue of contagion, it's, it's first and foremost. But I argue that it's not a matter just of contagion of pathogen. Again, give me some other examples of contagion beyond spreading nasty bugs. What else spread? Yeah, ideas. Ideas. I heard another information. Other habits. Habits. Beliefs. Attitudes. Innovation. Many, many types of of key quantities in, in the human sphere spread in this contagion. And this has great implications for men because in many spheres, if we don't focus on the hubs, we've lost the game, basically. The action is in the hubs. And our zero, I'm gonna come back, I think I'm coming back to that are not maybe less than one when computed with the average contact per day, the SIR model might have or not be this, average contact per day times beta times tau, computed naively, that's what you think it is. It may be less than one, but the infection survives. The infection spreads. Because what part of the population keep it alive? What part of the population keep it circulating? What part of the population does it spread it effectively enough that it stays alive? Between the what? Gives with an H. Hubs. Between the hubs. It stays alive. It stays circulating. And there's a lot of cases where communicable diseases that you would think naively based on the average contact rates should die out actually stay alive because of the small segment of the population. Maybe it's 5%, maybe it's 10% with very large numbers of connections. That's a crisis on the one hand. It's a danger. But ladies and gentlemen, it's also an opportunity because we can focus, focus limited resources, precious resources, constrained resources on those, that segment of the population to good effect. That doesn't mean to the exclusion of everyone else, but disproportionately they have an accelerant effect that disproportionately you can pay attention to them and, and uh, focus interventions on them. So our interventions may be able to go much further 
if we focus our efforts on that segment of the population. Disparity matters. Disparity in contact matters hugely. Infection spread. Now, I want to come back to Mark's point and sharpen it a little bit. So Mark argued with reason and clarity that we're talking about for scale name free network for a power law. And I inquired with him, and he duly responded as to what over what quantity that that power law is defined. It's over the number of connections. And we said that was the what we call degree of networks. So if we call this degree of the given agent degree. Here, I'm gonna get rid of these extraneous points, but this is the degree. And what we're plotting here is proportion of the population with that degree, or the probability of having that degree on the three days of one. What we see is a scale-free distribution. And broadly, it will look something like most of it will be way down here on the lower side, but it will have a very long one. A heavy, we call it a heavy one, the tail on the upper side. We talk about black swans in certain areas of risk. These unlikely events, which would be really catastrophic if they occur. And it's because of these heavy tails and degree distance. Most people might have one, two, maybe you know, one, one or two sexual partners per week or what have you. And then you've got some people maybe it's a hundred per week. Don't get it right. Um, or, you know, 200 per week or something like that. Uh, or you have needle sharing connections where most people at zero or maybe one. Um, but then you have some people who, who share a lot and it's just like an accelerator. But it's not all, it's all about pathogen, right? It's about these other areas of, of human existence. You get some people and in earlier times it might have been the hairstylists in the community that are just hubs of information passing around information, rumors, and and, and you know, uh, hearsay, et cetera, and it spreads information around, right? Or you get people who were just hubs for passing out hateful comment online and who are positions of prominence, like owning certain companies, and, and spread that, spread that out. So you get some people way out here in the distribution, and those people matter hugely. Each of them may be, you know, like the influence of a thousand people down here, right? Um, and often we draw this graph. This, this graph is very good, a very long tail, and to capture the full breadth of it, the large dynamic degree, the degree to which it stretches out over a long range of scales, we actually draw it on a different type of axis. But before I describe that, I'll just write this proportion. If, if we write the degree, call it K, that's what it's traditionally been called, like contacts, something like that. The proportion or probability of having K connections is proportional, that's what, meaning it's, it's just some constant times. And you remember this one time? Sorry? So it turns turns out it's 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 something like this. Why is it minus gamma? Why is it minus? I wrote that. P of K is proportional to, so it's just a constant times. If, if that confuses you, if that looks like an alpha, I'll just write in some constant. Don't call it C, just ah, call it, ah, call it, uh, what should I, uh, I'll call it, I'll call it mu because I haven't used it. I'm sorry, that's not, that's, that's omega. 
call it omega times k. This is just some some constant. Don't worry about it. It's just some constant, so it totals up to one when you sum it over all k. If k to the minus gamma, the fact that it's a minus, this gamma is positive. Um, I'll tell you means that as k gets larger, the proportion that have that number goes up or down. Goes down. Right. This is. I can equally write this as gamma times one over k to the what? K to the gamma. Right. Yeah. So as k gets larger, you know, uh, if you have a large number to a power in the denominator, and this power for for a lot of human networks, it's somewhere between like. 2.5 and and like 3.5 or something like that meaning it drops pretty quickly here but it actually stays um stays uh, pretty long okay so if we have this we, we get this sort of long tail effect with with gamma uh, like that and so how do we display it? Does anyone remember from my brief discussion of scale free numbers in that, in that video? How do we display it? With a one plot, a one plot plot. Log, log, log. That's not repeating ourselves. It, it's a log, log, log. The two scale, the two, the two axes are both. Log. So we have log of what on the x axis. Instead of k, we have log of <laughs> And what do we have on the, the y axis? Instead of proportion, we have log of proportion. Good. And I'm going to tell you this is interesting when it's of this form. Hmm? So I wrote it over there and, 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 and do write this for the group over here. I'll write it here. So we have P of K, the proportion that have K contacts to the population or the fraction of the, the, the or the probability of having that many connections. You gotta get like a robot that will follow me around the video we learn. Something like that. Um, so I'm going to write it as oh, there. Omega times k to the minus m. So if I take the log of this, what do I get? What do I get in the left? Do I get something you recognize? Do I get something you recognize on the left hand side? What if I take the log of What do I get? If I take the log of p of k, I get. Well, yeah, okay, that's true, but I'm just going to write log p of k, right? That equals what? Okay, if I take the now the log of this right hand side, which is right now omega times k to the minus gamma, what do I get on the right? Okay, so I get, so when I take the log of a times b, I get what? Sorry? Log of a plus log of b. Don't, don't tell me if you take the log of a plus of a times b, find that you get a plus b. Not going to get log of a plus log of b, right? Okay, so I'm going to write this as log of omega. Oh, you know, plus, right? Because it's times this k to the minus gamma times log of k to the minus gamma. But we can do better than that. What is log of k to the minus gamma? Do, do you remember this? The minus gamma of k? Yeah. yeah. Log of gamma plus, uh, and we have minus gamma. So I'll just write, instead of writing plus minus, so I'll write minus gamma times what? So log of k to the minus gamma is what? Gamma minus gamma times what? Log k. Is there somewhere in this equation that log of k equals log gamma minus the gamma log k? I'm sorry. 
Log omega minus gamma log x. Now, log omega is just some constant. It, it's just um, some constant. We're, we're not going to worry about it that much. We'll, we'll show where it comes in. But do you recognize, like, where does log k go on this graph? This log log graph. Goes on the x axis. Do you find the y axis somewhere? Here, right? This is just like y equals a minus b, you know, times x, right? What does that look like if I plot it out? Oh. Oh, that's like a straight line, right? Do you get that? Hmm? So if, if k were 1, log of k is 1, k is 1, log of k is 1, 0. And what does this say? This whole thing now. It's log of log of log of a, right? That's just the empty stuff. That's just this thing up here. And what's the slope of this? What's the slope going down here? Yeah, slope is minus gamma. I mean, if it were if it were a positive thing, it would be going up. If it were a negative thing, it's going down, right? So what I'm saying is, I know this may seem funky, and I have slides on this, and I'll post them, but the basic deal is if you have a scampering network, as Mark observed. It observes, it, it generates, it, uh, an emergent property from it, it gives rise to a power law distribution on contacts, meaning most people have a small number, some people have a huge number. <laughs> and as a power law, you take the law on of of the probability of having a certain number of contacts and the proportion of contacts, you, you get something involving log k with a straight line. The straight line plug plug on a log log graph. And there's a shocking number of cases where phenomena in the world, phenomena of time, connectivity of internet sites. The 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 um, metrics on our software development projects, the number of contacts people have of different sorts. If you plot it out, the data you get over time, if you collect it, it, it forms one of these curves with with gamma as an exponent in the power law falling commonly. In the range like 2.5 to 3.5 or 2 to 4, if you want to be generous. And it results. And so, so it observes this power. And it's so when we see that, we recognize this is accelerating effect on dynamics over that. It accelerates the spread. So when we think about process, it's all about process. So much of people's attention day to day when they're working to understand systems is about data. Data is great, but data often gives snapshots or or sort of little snippets from a broader underlying system, and then. In this class, our attention is on processes that operate over time, dynamics, things that change over time. Dynamical systems, so these systems where it's change over time depends on its state, its current state. And we care about the power law, and I'm emphasizing it for two reasons about dynamics of systems. One is, that when you have a power law distribution, and, and this is a log axis, you've got some people way out here on the right, and that small segment of the population, that 5% of the population or 2% of the population, maybe the tail that wags the dog in terms of how infection spreads and whether infection 
stays in the population. It's not about just most people. It's, it's, in many cases, when you have this sort of situation, it's about that minority that that have high risk behavior, high numbers of contacts. It's about that smaller segment of the population. That's where the battle is lost and lost. The other is not irrelevant. It's just um, we have to have overwhelming attention to that group because they're like an accelerant in the fire spread, right? Um, so that's one reason. I'm asking you to think about counter laws as yielding driving behavior disproportionately. That's one reason. But the other thing is that this power law distribution, which I drew there in the unlaw transform, to use an awkward term, our law transform pattern over here to the right, that power law results from a process. itself comes out of a process. There is a process behind it in many cases that gives rise to that disparity, gives rise, rise to this power law. Gives rise to a small fraction of the population having a far disproportionate number of connections. Orders of magnitude more than the than the than the um, most common one. It's given rise to a body process. And does anyone have a sense of what that process involves that gives rise to it? This underlying thing that generates this power law the underlying network. It's an important thing to know about. For me, why? why? Where does that come from? This power law, this extreme disparity. In many cases, it comes from why? It comes from a key program, that's true, but not these. What, what process does it come from? It comes from a process of preferential attack. I, I'm sorely tempted, you know, for dramatic effect, I came very close to letting this up with a snap and, and writing it down, but it's the devil of a thing to pull down. So um, I don't want to do it. I'm going to write it here. Preferential, preferential attachment. Now, that's a fancy term. Can anyone give me some sense of what that might mean? Preferential attack. We use this term to describe a certain type of person. Yes, Mark. It's, it's not like all of those countries are not at the same time, but it's, it's very hard to have to know the way some experiments. And when we know the time, it's more of an early to come back to the period of already okay okay so you got the essence of it i'm gonna refine it a little bit but kudos to you kudos to you again so the idea is that it's not all nodes so much it's not all connections or relationships so certain connections breed others. And basically those with a large number of connections tend to get what? More connections. Those who have tend to get more. Those who don't have tend to get more or less treatment. They, they, they don't get more. Uh, much more. And so much more commonly they, they're not getting added to. It's those, when they consider where a new node, a new connection goes, it goes to those who already have it. Mm -hmm. 
And too much in our society is this way. There's a perverse form of the golden rule. Do those with the gold those the ability to set the rules. Um, it's a perverse form of the gold rule. It's not something I'm advocating, but but it's something that's all too often the case. To those with the money, with the existing wealth, goes the ability to, to acquire more money, the ability to skip on taxes, the ability to hire teams of lawyers so you can see your way to, you know, earning more yet, the ability to set the playing field in terms of competition, the ability to to hedge your risk uh, across many instruments and be less at the vagaries of the economy, of the economic downturns, et cetera. It's not just a matter of wealth, it extends to many other areas, political power, et cetera. Um, all too often, those who have are the ones who get more, and those who don't have are disadvantaged. All too often, that is a feature of situations. And sometimes it's not one we view as moral appropriate. It's one we view as just an aspect of the situation. Sites that have a lot of links tend to get linked to by other sites and therefore acquire more. People with a lot of connections on LinkedIn get connected to by a lot of others who care about them and they get more connected. People with a lot of followers on YouTube get very widely known by word of mouth and acquire more, more links, right? Um, you could have similar things on any number of social network platforms. This is not always one that has moral concerns or equity, deep equity concerns associated with it, but it, it's, it's a pronounced feature, unfortunately, uh, in, in some cases, which do have unfairness associated with it. And this phenomenon of preferential attachment is, in fact, how we typically generate scale free dominance. So the actual algorithm for generating uses exactly this property. As I'm adding new connections into the network, I add them much more frequently. I add them, and I'm going to exaggerate it, but I add them proportional to the number of connections they are. It's not quite that because then those that are zero would never get any. But it's that gives the basic gist of the idea. So if something has twice as many connections as another one, Twice as I could add it to that, roughly speaking. So, scale free networks tend to lead to this phenomenon. I want to, I'm sorry, excuse me. Why don't we see a power law network? A power, yeah, power law network. Power law distribution on the number of connections, it is often, it whispers to us that there is some generating process. Of, of preferential of attaching to things that already have lots of connections. Not always, but often that's the case. Now, there's one other thing I want to I want to make the point. What is your um this is a very important thing for you to understand. So so we have this formula um T of K equals gamma times, so P of K equals gamma times K of gamma. And I have unpacked it for those who are, who are you know, trying to puzzle through the minus and the, and the exponent and so on as omega times K to the, times one over K to the gamma. And I'm putting it on this side to be fair. And that's what made this outside. We could even put it in the right? Okay, so let's, let's consider the case of 
one connection, someone who has one connection versus two connections in terms of the ratio of them. Okay. Um, it might actually be easiest to, yeah, uh, fine. Uh, we'll, we'll keep it this way. Okay, so let's consider the ratio of people that have two, two connections uh, versus one connection. Okay. Um, so if we do this with two connections, what do we get? Can anyone plug it in? What do we get? If we do it with two connections, k equals two, then what do we get? One over two to the gamma, right? If we do it with one connection, what do we get? Omega times, yeah, times one to the one to the gamma, which is just one, right? Now, if you take the ratio of them, what are you going to get? Well, let's do it in general. Um, so we're going to we're going to do this. We're going to see that this ratio, um, which in this case happens to be one over two to the gamma, um, is going to reflect a more general rule. So we're going to look at p to the two p of two k probability or proportion that of two k connections over p of k. Can you do it all? So what's in the numerator? What do we have? So what's upstairs here? So we're going to take the ratio. We're taking the p of two k divided by p of k. What do we have upstairs? Omega times uh, one over uh, two k power of one. Yeah, that's right. One over two k to the power of gamma. And if we factor this further, what do we get? Well, okay, I'll, I'll do the whole thing and then we'll factor it a little bit, right? Um, what's in the denominator? Good. One over k to the best. Good. Okay. Excellent. Uh, k to the best. Right? Um, okay, what things cancel immediately? The omegas, right? Um, and this is then uh, anyone. Uh, so what do we what do we have? Okay, so we have the fraction and the numerator, fraction the denominator. What do we do? Yeah, the lower one up, up upstairs to just the single fraction, right? And we have what do we have in the denominator of that? Two k to the gap, right? Okay, yeah. Okay, now what if we expand this? So we have k to the gamma divided by 2k quantities to the gamma, right? What is that equal to? Well, let's let's expand the denominator. Just to do it brutally step by step. What's the denominator equal to? Two to the gamma times k to the gamma. Now that should stir joy in your heart. Why do I say this k to the gamma and the denominator can stir joy in your heart? Cancels out, right? Huh? So this is all equal to what? Yeah, two to the minus gamma. Love it, hope that trick uh, simplified that. Two to the minus gamma. One over two to the gamma, right? So what I'm saying is, no matter how big k is, two to two compared to one, right? Um, or or 200 compared to 100, or 2,000 compared to 1,000, or 40 compared to 20. This ratio is always two to the minus gamma. The fraction that a twice is betting compared to just having, you know, if, if you consider a given K, the fraction that is that number compared to twice as many, the ratio of those is always the same, no matter how far you look out in this, in this thing, it's always it's always two to the minus gamma. So if gamma were two, what would that what would that be? Sorry? Sorry? Say it again. Point two five. Yeah, one over four, right? If gamma is two, right? Two to the minus two. 
Hmm? It's one over two to the two. Two to the two is four. Right? Um, so that would be saying if, if gamma were two, you'd be saying your chance of having 200 connections compared to your chance of having 100, it's just only a quarter as many people have 200 connections. Only a quarter as many people have 2,000 connections as has 1,000. Start to get a sense why the tail is long. It doesn't go down that quickly as you accelerate in terms of number of value of K. Do you see that? Probability of having 40 connections compared to 20, one quarter. If, if gamma was, were, were uh, two. If gamma were three, the probability of having 40 connections compared to, to 20 connections would be what? The ratio of those probabilities would be what? If they have over three, it would be what? One eight, right? One eight. So um, I'm only I'm eight times less likely to have 200 connections compared to 100. I'm eight times less likely to do 2,000 compared to 1,000. But it doesn't go down that quickly. And this is why this tail is really long. No matter how far you go out, you know, probably having 10 times that number it just goes down as, as this here. Uh, uh, th this, uh, so it's uh, associated with uh, the two to the minus gamma. Twice, you probably would have twice as many connections compared to this number of connections. It just goes down to two to the minus gamma. So, so it goes down slowly. Not how big you look. That's why it's scale for you. It doesn't matter how far you look out. It's that same ratio. Do you get that? It's independent of scale. This value, two to the minus gamma, doesn't depend on k. It's independent of scale. No matter how far you look at it, it's the same rule governing the proportion that you know that have k connections versus two k. Two to the minus gamma. Hmm? Okay. How much of P needed? So many things. Spread of ideas, spread of rumors, spread of conspiracy, spread of attitudes, spread of beliefs, etc. Um, and we we characterize them. We characterize these contagion processes as commonly occurring. The video I asked you to watch for today is about stylized models. What are stylized models? Well, they're kind of caricatures of models. They're not going to depict a very specific circumstance with exact values and parameters. They're trying to capture the general feel of the situation. And they're often used for theory building, for developing better and better understanding of what might be driving our situations in general, rather than trying to understand a very specific circumstance. They're often simple. They characterize simple ideas. And they're, they're not Often they're not meant to depict a you know full theory of the world, but rather a, a certain thinking of maybe some essential features of the situation, kind of like a sketch, right? And just like a political cartoon might capture essential features of a political figure's physique, their big chin or you know their big ears or something, and capture sort of a a basic recognizable truth. These stylized models try to capture kind of a, a recognizable, possible feature of the world so we can think through its implications. Like we're, we're using them as cognitive processes, as, as thinking tools, as learning processes, 
these tools to help us think through how just a small number of simple things might fit together. What sort of behaviors they show? Because we're not very good at doing that. So we put together a little model and we try it out with very simple rules. Give me one example of a stylized model. Game of life. Game of life is a classic. A game of life is particularly deep in its implications in computer science. Anyone know why? So it turns out game of life is it has simple rules. Very simple description, right? I can describe it. Bird cells, each of them is either alive or dead. Hmm? Cells that are live, so time is in discrete time steps. Consider a given cell uh, that's currently live. It'll survive if only if it has two or three neighbors. And a cell that's empty, that's dead, doesn't have anything. It'll form a new live cell if it has exactly anyone know how many neighbors. Great. Very simple description. This rise to profound consequence. Now, these consequences for computer scientists are particularly interesting. Anyone know why? Yes, Mark. That's right. That's right. It's as powerful as a Turing machine. It's as powerful as the world's biggest supercomputer. It's as powerful as your desktop computer, your laptop computer, your phone. These are all computationally universal. What we can do on we can do on one, putting aside limited memory, putting aside a limited size of a hard drive, and capacity constraint. Any algorithm can be run on one or the other. It doesn't mean it runs just as fast. It doesn't mean it runs you know, with just as much ease of, of of getting it to run, but it's it can be run on any of them. It's computationally universal. Has anyone here heard of a Turing machine? Okay, a Turing machine is a model of computation. I think you heard about it, what, 364? Yeah. So cellular automata are another model of computation. They're just as powerful as Turing machines. You can build a model. Uh, excuse me. You can build a cellular automata model of a computer and run it, and it will do computation. You can build AND gates, OR gates. So you typically start with NAND gates, not AND. And you can build up a computer. It's a perfectly good substrate for computing. Not all models are. We can't play yeah. And Huge number of hours have been spent by recreational game of life users, as well as more serious researchers who defined computers with it, performed computation. So you can compute factorial with the game of life if you're so inclined to do so. So that's an example of a stylized model with sort of broad computational implications. But there's many other stylized models that get us to think through of a situation, how they shape outcomes. Not all models are big, gargantuan monoliths that try to study a very specific circumstance, have full fidelity to a situation in the, in the world in terms of certain essentials, and produce results to understand that circumstance or world. Some are designed as thinking. Some are designed to build theory, to build understanding on our part about how certain basic factors interact. That's what stylized models are about. And stylized models can be created in some dynamic models. SIR, in the same way, a very stylized model. It doesn't exactly describe COVID 19, it doesn't exactly describe RSV or 
influenza. It doesn't exactly describe, you know, uh, something like uh, measles or chicken pox, but it's a very good tool for developing understanding of basic concepts and intuition, such as the basic reproductive, such as the epidemic curve such as the idea of equilibria in their existence, such as the idea of the key role that the fraction of susceptibles plays in throttling the spread of infection. It helps us think more critically. Models, ladies and gentlemen, are not perfect depictions of the world. You know, attempts to be a perfect depiction of the world that are useless if they run astray and, and don't capture. They're not crystal balls that we look to to predict the future in order to exactly understand what will happen. And if they don't predict correctly, they're like a trapped crystal ball we throw into the garbage. No, this is not the role models play. Models are thinking tools that help us think more quickly, more thoroughly, more deeply, more robustly, more rigorously both things in the world. And truth. It's not that they capture truth. It's that they speed up towards the truth by debugging our thinking, by helping us understand where our thinking is flawed. It just is not consistent. It doesn't add up. It's not consistent with how things work with, with certain interacting processes. And stylized models have a role to play in helping debugging our thinking, helping us think through how just a few simple factors, like those depicted here or in a taking based analog, SIR model, interact to give rise to dynamic behavior, whether over time, over space over networks, once up here, um, or, or more broadly in another model. So these are the tools. They're not attempts to be the truth. They're attempts to speed us towards the truth by making our thinking deeper, quicker, faster, more reliable, more robust, and helping us spot our cherished misconceptions more quickly. And, and helping us root them out. And that, ladies and gentlemen, that is the craft of model. And with those words, I will leave you today. And I hope to see you again on Thursday at my recovery. Thank you very much. It's good, ladies and gentlemen, to be back. I like teaching in person. It's a lot more interesting. <laughs> um, yeah. Just had a question. So, sure.